Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's special features, the coming buyer's market in automobiles. Then a new department, the sports section. And finally, if we don't run fresh out of time, which quite likely we may, we'll have a piece on trade across the Iron Curtain in Europe. Now, your tomorrow morning's headlines tonight. Willis Overland cuts automobile prices $25 to $270. The top cut is on Willis Overland's uh, well-known Jeepster. Now you'll notice at once that while this is the second post-war automobile price cut, it is by far the biggest one. General Motors, in general, cut prices between $10 and $40 a car. Also, in the GM case, the price cut was definitely tied to a decline in payrolls under a contract that GM had with the union allowing uh, payroll cuts in the event of a decline in the cost of living, which took place. In the Willis Overland case, there is no such decline in payrolls. This is a straight and deep price cut in a bid for more business. This symbolizes an important turning point in the change of the automobile industry from a seller's to a buyer's market. Clearly, this is going to have tremendous psychological importance, this cut announced tonight. For though Willis Overland is not one of the larger producers in the automotive field, the fact that one firm does cut like this is going to suggest to buyers everywhere that other firms will too. And so I suspect you'll find buyers already cautious becoming even more so, with perhaps cumulative price cuts in the automotive industry. Indeed, there have been, we've all noticed them, a number of signs of weakening in the whole automobile structure recently. For example, my wife and I have been shopping for a car recently, and we discovered to our interest going around that not only on many cars is instant delivery available, particularly on the higher price models, but in addition, they tell you regularly now what they never would have told you six months ago, go sell your car someplace else. We don't want to need any trade-in anymore. No trade-in required. Well, that's a pretty big change, and in view of all these evidences of impending change in the buyer-seller relationship in the automobile field, I thought it might be a good idea tonight to take a look at the general trend of production and prices over a period of years. So first, here's production, shown here from 1929 on, in millions of cars. Those figures at the left each indicate one million. And beginning in 1929, you see how the production trend uh, goes on down the period of years. Starts out in 1929, way above four million, drops sharply into the Depression, uh, then, with the Depression more or less over, rises past the three million mark, almost hits four million again, plunges downward again in a bad year in 1938, up again, 39, 40, up to the start of the war. Well, then, of course, in the start of the war, civilian production of automobiles was pretty much off altogether. It hit pretty well down to the bottom, stayed there until post-war, everything for the war effort. And then post-war uh, starts up very sharply, up to 1949, of course, 1949 is an estimate, but the estimate is somewhere between four and five million for this year. So there's your zigzag of production, and it's been enormously high, no, practically as high as 1929 in recent months. Now let's go from the question of production to the average price, average retail price per car sold. Here's the picture on that. In 1930, the average retail price of a car was $788. In 1934, the price average was $702, reflecting the consequences of the Depression. 1938, it was $824. In 1940, a little bit higher still, as you see, about $850. Now, there wasn't any automobile production to speak of for civilian purposes during the war, so let's skip those years. And now, in 1946, see what post-war does. Average price, $1,229 per car, and 1948, the last year of which we have any real figures, $1,635. Well, you see how sharply the price trend is up since the war, and of course you've seen just a moment ago the great rise in post-war production. Apparently, we're coming to the point quite rapidly where it is no longer possible to sell full production of the automobile industry at today's very much higher prices. And consequently, you have the beginning big price cut today, which I suspect does mark a turning point. Willis Overland's action will mark a turning point in the change in the automobile business from the sellers to the buyer's market. Now it's 10% increase in the new rent bill. 
I'm not going to take very much time on that because this bill's in committee stage now. It was in banking subcommittee in the Senate last night, and they wrote in a provision for 15% rent increases. Now the full banking committee wrote in a provision for 10% increases with the provision again that if you've had a rent increase 10% or more, you can't have any further increase. It's important, but it's not too important because I think this bill will change a half a dozen times more before it finally gets through the Senate. So we'll just note that fact, the 10% rent increase is in tonight on a provision that would extend the rent control laws from 12 to 15 months, depending upon different circumstances. Italian commies riot in effort to block the Atlantic Pact. These, of course, are definitely planned communist riots. This one, by the way, is in Rome today, designed to prevent Italy from joining the Atlantic Pact. Communists are filibustering in the Italian parliament. They've been talking straight for 36 hours now and probably can do it another day if they feel like it. The idea is that if they can provoke enough riots in enough places throughout Italy, the Italian parliament may feel sentiments against the Atlantic Pact and vote it down. By the way, there's nothing wrong with your television. That man's face is the mess it appears to be on the scope. Both of these pictures, by the way, have been taken of Rome riots today, but there were other riots during the day in Milan, in Genoa, and in numerous smaller places throughout Italy. The toll thus far, I think, is one dead and nine injured, but probably there'll be more before it's all over. The riots are still in progress. Recovery first, then arms aid, U.S. tells Europe. This is an announcement put out by our State Department today in connection with the impending publication of the Atlantic Pact terms at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. The uh, State Department says that uh, we will have a new land lease to supplement the Atlantic Pact, that is to build up military strength in Western Europe, but where there's a conflict in demand for materials, the Marshall Plan, basic recovery, will take priority over the supply of tanks and guns and implements of war to Europe. I suspect that as time goes on, though, you'll find that we will do both, and do both in abundant measure, that is both Marshall Plan, basic recovery, machine tools and the like, and then guns and tanks, because we do want to strengthen the armed forces of Western Europe as a means of deterring the possibility of deterring Russia from an attack and an aggression that would lead to a general war. Truman to give views on Congress at News Parley. Thus far, the President has said nothing since he's taken it on the chin three times from Congress recently on rents, on the filibuster, and on the Mon Wagon appointment. And since Mr. Truman, in a recent, uh, on a recent occasion, showed uh, that he could speak his mind quite pungently on that occasion when he made certain references to a radio commentator, you can bet your sweet life that every newsman that can get to Key West is going to be there tomorrow morning when Mr. Truman holds this news conference where he's supposed to express himself quite breezily on his views on the 81st Congress. He expressed himself quite effectively during the campaign on the 80th Congress. Now perhaps he'll have something to say on the 81st. We'll all be listening anyhow. Conductors' Union calls Pullman strike for March 31st. Actually, I doubt very much whether this strike will come off at all, because it seems to me that what you've got here is the usual technique. The Pullman Conductors' Union calls a strike for a given date. That will force the president to appoint a fact-finding board. The fact-finding board will postpone the strike for 30 days and uh, may get some added impetus toward a, uh, toward a settlement. The, um, of course, that didn't happen, I recognize, in the Wabash Railroad strike, because in the Wabash Railroad, you had the fact that the men struck before the fact-finding board was appointed. They have not gone back to work, even tonight. That 2,500-mile road is still strike-bound, and as a consequence, Wabash today began laying off about 8,500 non-operating employees, in addition to the 3,500 or so who are now out on strike. And now, services unite press agents at Washington level. This is a rather interesting thing. It's been brewing for a long time. We've had a situation here recently where the public relations officers of the, of the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force have all been competing. It's sort of the war of each against all, each trying to get more commercial advertising, you might say, for its own service. The flight around the world, that nonstop flight at the Lucky Lady of the Second, was uh, quite clearly, in part, uh, for the purpose of impressing Congress with public relations material and getting more appropriations. So as a consequence of that, the um, uh, idea is it's a bad idea to have each of the three forces press co services competing. So we now unite them at the top. But what I wonder is this. Will unification of the public relations offices of the three at the top do the job, or do you have to unite them all down the line? Well, we'll see on that one. To me, there is something of a question. And now, the sports section. First, I think the most important sports news from the national standpoint tonight is the fact that Loyola beat Bradley 55 to 50 in a game that ended about half an hour ago at Madison Square Garden. That's the National Invitational Basketball Tournament. But from the standpoint of most of us here in Illinois, 
The big news, basketball-wise and sport-wise, tonight is our state tournament. So let's go and see what's been taking place in the tournament down at Champaign-Urbana at the University of Illinois. Here's the picture in today's games. West Aurora, 45. And Elgin, 42. And here's a shot of the West Aurora-Elgin game. Elgin captain Bob Cervant goes up to for a shot at the basket. And note the harness holding Cervant's right arm down. That's a hangover from a football injury last fall. Despite that harness, Cervant averaged about 15 points a game. Without the harness, he undoubtedly would have averaged around 20. Well, the next score, Decatur, 82. And Pittsfield, 48. And now moving on, Tilden of Chicago, 68. And ROVA of Oneida, 41. Mount Vernon, this gets quite a ways downstate, 54. And Johnson City, 52. And moving over to our third map of our state, Moline, 64. And West Rockford, 38. And finally, Nashville, 43, Ottawa, 39. Now, uh, Robinson and Pekin are playing right at the present time. We just got the halftime score. It's Robinson, 26, Pekin, uh, 27. And of course, Hillsborough plays Champagne later tonight. There's no result of that in at the present time. The Mexican secret police disclosed today the recovery of a small cylinder of uranium, which they said must have been stolen from the United States. And that, friends, will have to be telecommentary for tonight. Be with us again tomorrow at this same time, and until then, this is Clifton Utley again bidding you good night.